Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture we read just a moment ago over in Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. Today we're looking at Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, part 4. You wonder where in the world is Naomi here in this text? She's here, believe it or not. <laughs> and you'll see that in a few minutes, the Lord willing. Now I want to give a quick review of what we added last week. The first thing we noticed in our overview in this particular passage contains one of God's most important principles in his plan for the divine training and discipline of his children. You've heard the phrase, no pain, no gain. Well, that's not just an athletic principle. It's a divine principle that God uses to conform his people to the image of Christ. We also saw the principle of pain first for focus, cleansing, and growth. That's why God puts it first before he gives us the gain. He wants us to focus. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to make us grow. And we saw that that was true not only here, but in many other places. Right here we have Mara, the bitter waters made sweet, before Elim, sweet water from the beginning. So the bitter comes before the sweet. We saw the wilderness wanderings had to take place before they could enter Canaan and have conquest. There were 40 years of wandering before the 40 years of conquest. We saw the cross before the crown. That's a clear example from the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore also God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The cross had to come before the crown. Suffering before glory. Pain before relief. That's what I've told you many times is the principle of the way up is down. If you want to go up, you can't just climb up there and do it by your own bootstraps. It's humility first. The way up is down. And then God will exalt you. There are many other examples as well. We saw the worst before the better with the water turned to wine in John 2.10. We saw suffering before glory in Luke where Jesus is speaking on the road to Emmaus where he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, that's first, and to enter in to his glory, that was second. Down in verse 46 it says, Thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. The suffering first, the glory second. This is a lesson that God teaches all the way through Scripture. The book of Exodus is a full-length book expounding that principle that you must go through the tests first before you receive the rewards. No teacher gives her students blue ribbons before they take the test. The test comes first and then the rewards. In the same context over in Romans chapter 28, Sometimes we think we're going through unbearable suffering now, but God has designed it for our good and for his glory because the suffering burns the dross, the trash, the wickedness out of our life and conforms us to the image of Christ. Paul says, and we know that all things, not just the good things, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. God guarantees that whatever has come into your life he has designed it for your good and to help conform you into the likeness, the reflection of Jesus Christ. Do you have bad things in your life? Do you have things that are painful? Do you have things that are causing suffering? Do you have things that cause grief? God is faithful. He will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted or put to the test. Above that you are able but will the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. When things seem to be going totally wrong, remember God is faithful. He has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. He is using this test and he is restricting this test to conform you to the image of Christ. What a blessed thought. What a glorious thought. For the God of the universe has a personal interest in me and a personal interest in you. 
and nothing ever happens outside of his sovereign will designed to conform us to the image of Christ. What a magnificent thought that God would love us that much. In the same context, down in verses 17 and 18, uh, we find suffering before glory. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now listen, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And Paul says, you know, it doesn't matter how bad it gets here, because listen to what he says. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. Suffering before glory. Suffering before glory. And the suffering is little teeny weeny compared to the magnificence of the glory that is yet to come. When you get discouraged, remember that. When you feel depressed, remember that. The sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Those are encouraging words. The key to all of this is that we've got to learn to quit complaining about how much we hurt and how much we're suffering because of our present experience and our emotions. Because God is using those events in our lives, which are very, very small on the scope of the eternal time scale, he's using those events to conform us to the image of Christ. We saw that Paul wrote that to the young Timothy. Timothy was going through some tough times, and Paul wrote, it's a faithful saying, for if we dead with him, we shall also live with him, death before life. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him, suffering before reigning. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Over in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Horrible pressures on the outside, but God is doing something inside to renew us and to strengthen us. Now listen to what he says here. Now this is a man who was beaten. This was a man who was lashed with a cat of nine tails. This is a man who suffered shipwreck. This is a man who got stoned. This is a man who uh, had people betray him right and left. This is a man who was chased from town to town to town by people who hated him. And you'd say, man, he's really got a lot to suffer. You know what he calls it? Our light affliction. Our light affliction. All that problem that Paul was suffering, he called it a light. It was like a feather on him. It didn't matter at all because he had the eternal perspective. A light affliction, which is but for a moment. You see, the affliction is temporary. It doesn't matter what you're suffering right now. It's temporary. It could last 100 years. It's temporary. None of you have had an affliction that lasts 100 years because none of you are 100 years old. You say, well, it's lasted for 10 years. It's temporary. It's light compared to eternity. Listen, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Affliction first, very light. Eternal glory, grandiose. Affliction before glory, affliction before glory, suffering before glory. This is a major theme throughout the scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. James says this, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, that is when he is put to the test, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The test comes before the crown. That's the way God has designed it. We saw in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Prison, suffering, torture, and then the crown. Dear people, we need to focus on eternity. We need to focus on eternity. Yes, we live in time. Yes, the sufferings are real. But when we compare them with eternity, it changes our viewpoint on everything happening around us. The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Don't hold too tightly to the things of earth. They will never satisfy, 
and you can't take them with you, and they crumble and they rot and they decay. Think about heavenly rewards, which never crumble, never rot, never decay. And suddenly your life will have a new focus and be filled with joy and peace, regardless of the circumstances of life. Hebrews is a unique book in the New Testament, also speaks of this principle. It talks about the discipline that God gives us. He's speaking to believers. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. That comes first. Chastening comes first. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward, what comes second? It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Almost every writer of scripture deals with this particular principle, and the book of Exodus is an exposition for an entire book length of this principle, as God disciplines his people through the wilderness. The epistles of Peter have a special focus on the suffering of Christians. 1 Peter chapter 1 searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory which should follow. Suffering first, glory second. Dealing with us in chapter 4. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Like, well, I've been a good little Christian. I've been a good little pink goody two-shoes. Uh, how come I'm having to suffer right now because I've been doing everything good? Oh, I don't like to suffer, Lord. He says, don't think that it's a strange thing when you suffer. Do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. It's not just a little bit of suffering. It's called a fiery trial, which is to try you. That is going to happen as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know what? It happens to every believer at some point in his or her life. But rejoice. That's how we're to respond. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed. He may be glad also with exceeding joy. Suffering first and the glory to follow. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. Now get the fourth one, because this is where most of us always say, well, I'm not a murderer, a thief, I'm not an evildoer. Or as a busybody in other men's matters. Being a busybody gets put in the same category as murderers and thieves. Are you a busybody? Are you always sticking your nose into somebody else's business? Always looking for the most salacious gossip that you can think of so you can whisper it as a prayer request for a brother so-and-so who is just so badly in sin. That's a busybody in other men's matters. And that is put in the same category as a murderer and a thief and an evildoer. We need to be careful, folks. God doesn't look at things the way man looks at them. The divine viewpoint is totally different. But verse 16 says, Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Have you ever suffered for being a Christian? Or have you only suffered for your own stupidity? Many of us suffer for our own stupidity. But we never suffer because we're Christians. What have you suffered because you are a Christian? It's coming. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. God looks at the world. He says, yeah, there's a lot of evil there. God looks in the church. He says, hmm, a lot of evil there too. Where I'm going to start house cleaning is in my own house. Judgment begins in the house of God. That's what you said. I just read that to you. The time has come. The judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them? that obey not the gospel of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? 
You know, we're always saying, God, the rest of the world is bad. Look at them. See how bad they are? Oh, those bad guys out there. I don't like those bad guys. Do something about the bad guys. God says, let me look in your heart, which is full of all kinds of rot and corruption and lust and hate and envy and pride and gluttony and sloth. God begins at home. God begins at home. Verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. It's not the will of God that you should suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as a, a busybody in other men's matters. But the will of God is that you will suffer as a Christian. And when that happens, commit the keeping of your soul to him by doing the right thing, in well-doing. That's what that means. Because he's your faithful creator. He hasn't forgotten you. He is with you. Jesus promised it. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He promised in Hebrews, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What shall man do unto me? Different perspective on the world around us because it's the divine perspective and God has given it to us in his word. First Peter chapter 5, another chapter down, Peter says, Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. Are you troubled? Are you worried? Are you full of care? You know what? Jesus can bear it and you can't. Let him carry it. Don't try to carry it yourself. It will crush you. Because you've got an enemy that's out there ready to eat you up. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom? Resist steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the, ah, oh, here we are, go again, suffering. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It happens to all Christians. There will be a point of suffering. Sometimes it comes from the world. Sometimes it comes from the weakness of our flesh. Sometimes it comes, as we learn here, from the devil and his demonic forces. But when you go through the affliction, it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, why can't he get off that theme of suffering? Because it is true for us all. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Last week we looked at quite a number of passages in the Psalms, in John, Matthew, Luke. The second thing that we noted was that the people murmured. The people griped, they complained. That was the first time their murmuring is recorded after they left Egypt. Now, they murmured once before they left Egypt. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the very first time they murmured or complained against Moses and God was only three days out from the crossing of the Red Sea. You know, most of us can't bear the inconvenience that sometimes comes our way before we start to complain and gripe and bellyache. The Bible says that God put Israel to the test Ten times. The Israelites complained ten different times, and God said, because you've done it ten times, I'm going to kill you. Do you know where you are on that list? Are you down at number one, down at number five, down at number seven, down at number nine? Are you about to complain number ten? Where are you on the scale? God said, there comes a point of no return. There comes a point when I'm going to kill you. God does that with those of his children who refuse to play ball for his team and always are carrying the ball across the football line the other end of the stadium. Folks, this is not a joke. This is serious business. We have illustrations of that throughout Scripture. God takes people home at certain times in their lives when they do what is not pleasing to him? Think about Ananias and Sapphira. Early church. Big church meeting. 
big donors, and God killed them. The ten times of rebellion brought Israel to the point of no return. God is long-suffering, but there is a point of no return. Now, we've looked at the first three times that Israel complained. And um, the first one was at the Red Sea. That was back in chapter 14, rebellion against God's qualified, appointed, and ordained leader. They were denied. The children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? I'd rather be an Egyptian slave than a dead free man. That's what they're saying. It had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Now, I want to add something to that that we did not cover last week. So this goes under point one of last week. Why is rebellion, this is the question, why is rebellion against God's ordained and qualified leadership rebellion against God? Why does God look at rebellion against his qualified ordained leadership, rebellion against him directly? There are at least four reasons. Four reasons why God says, rebellion against his intermediate leadership, which he has appointed, four reasons why it's rebellion against God. Number one, God always provides leadership in every sphere of authority which he has ordained. God always provides leadership in every sphere of authority which he has ordained. Now, obviously, leadership is necessary for those under authority, for their protection, for their direction, for their discipline, and a host of other reasons. And that, of course, is supported by many passages of Scripture. But there are four categories where the Bible specifically states that God provides intermediate leaders and commands those who are under their authority to obey them. Those four different areas of leadership are the home, the church, government, and work. So God provides leadership in every sphere of authority he's ordained. The four spheres of authority which he has ordained are the home, the church, the government, and work. In the home, we have two categories because there's a dual level of authority. The husband's at the top, the wife is underneath, and the children are underneath. So the children have to obey both father and mother, and the wife has to obey her husband. You say, oh yeah, show that to me in scripture. Okay, let's deal with the children first. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. There's a great promise connected to obeying your parents. It will be well with you, and you will live a long time on earth. How about Colossians 3.20? Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So that's level one. Down here with little kids, actually born ones, that goes up quite high. But we get over to the second category, which are wives. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. How do you submit to the Lord? You're supposed to do it in the same way when you submit to your husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You see, you're portraying a divine relationship. Christ is the heavenly bridegroom, the church is the bride. And so the husband portrays Christ, and the wife portrays the church. And he is the savior of the body, Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so in the same manner that the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Well, I keep 25% of the territory for myself, and my husband not going to tell me what to do, because that's my area. Oh, really? Is that the way you treat the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Yeah, Christ, you can have 75% of my life, but 25% I'm going to run on my own. You stick your jaw out and talk to him in Southern. <laughs> you rebels. Dangerous stuff, because these are commands. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. How about over in Colossians? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. God has ordained authority in the home. Very clearly stated in Scripture. How about in the church? That's the second area of authority. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them that hath the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Notice what kind of a lifestyle do they have, and does it produce holiness or does it produce wickedness? Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Now listen to the last six words. For that is unprofitable for you. Someday I have to give an account to Christ, certainly for myself. But someday I have to give an account for you. Each one of you, individually, for all the times I've had contact with you, that's been 10 years now, and I will not be able to lie or cover for you. I will be a witness, and I will give a report concerning you, because the scripture says so. I have no options, I have no choices. You can't cut a deal with me now. It won't work, because someday I stand before Christ, and so will you. And he says, witness number one, Dr. Carl McIntyre. Witness number two, Reverend Frank Mood. Witness number three, Reverend Alan McClure. Witness number four, Christian Spencer. People, it is not a joke and it will happen. We tend to think that the scripture doesn't apply to us. It does. Church pastors are also parallel to a father ruling a household and children where obedience is required. It should be noted that the requirements for the pastoral office are absolute. They are. Then the requirements for the obedience of the flock is also absolute provided the pastor does not require the violation of either a command or a prohibition of the Bible. So we find the pastors are being compared to parents taking care of children. I'll show you that. 1 Timothy chapter 3, one of the two big passages that lists the requirements for an elder. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Now here we get into the comparisons of the home and the church, the authority in the home and the authority in the church. One that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? The family is the microcosm of which the church is the macrocosm. In addition to the parallel authority of the father in the home, pastors clearly also have the authority to stop troublemakers, critics, and false teachers in the church. Titus chapter 1, verse 6. If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, 
having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. He's got his house in order. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Now listen to verse 9 and 10. He has the authority to stop troublemakers, critics, and false teachers. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince, that means bring it a conviction, the gainsayers, the people who are speaking against it. For there are many unruly and vain talkers. He can stop people's mouths. He has the authority to do that. And deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. There's authority here for the man that God has ordained for the pulpit. And I stand before you and I tell you the truth, not because it's me, but because this is what the word of God says. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. So what are you supposed to do about it? Well, I guess everybody's going to say what they want to say. No, no, no. Paul says, Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. There is authority there. Third area is government. Now, you're all familiar, I suppose, with Romans chapter 13, but let me read it to you, because it's very clear that Christians are supposed to obey the government, and Paul was writing under a government that oppressed Christians. The Roman government was not the friend of Christianity and didn't become so until the 300s under Constantine where it was a really weird form of Christianity and wishy-washy and all kinds of perversion taking place. But we're supposed to obey the government. Did you know that? That's the third sphere of authority and God has appointed the leadership. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Remember, we're talking about that first principle, which is, why when the people rebelled against Moses did God say they're rebelling against him? Why is rebellion against a lower authority exactly the same as rebellion against God himself? Because God puts the authorities in place in every sphere of authority. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power to do, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same? For he is the minister of God. We may not like the people that are in different political positions, in authority, in government, at every level. There are probably people you don't like. But the Bible says he's a minister of God to thee for good. If thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. That's an executioner's sword. For he is the minister of God. Twice it says that. He is the minister of God. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. For this very cause pay ye tribute also. Oh, here's the third time. For they are God's ministers attending continual upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, pay your taxes in other words, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. That's the third sphere of authority, where God says if you rebel against the intermediate authority that I've appointed, you're rebelling against me. Remember that's what it says? He says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever resists the power resists the ordinance of God. Fourth area is work. God has ordained authority in the work sphere. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, in the same way that you serve Christ, that's the way you're supposed to serve those who are your employers, those who are in authority over you. Not with eye service, you know, make it look good, but really there's all kinds of 
rotten corruption underneath, but you're always smiling, so they think everything's okay. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. Pretend your boss is Christ. Say, whoa, that's a stretch of the imagination. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who puts your boss in that position of authority over you because it's a test for you to see whether or not you will trust him to get you through the shenanigans of the workplace. Doing the will of God from the heart with goodwill doing service as to the Lord. In other words, you say, Lord, I don't understand this guy, but I'm serving you and so I'm going to do my very best and it'll make him look good and it'll make him get a raise. It'll make him feel proud and he may despise me and care less about me, but I'm serving you because you know my heart why I'm doing this at my workplace. Is that how you work? Do you do it as to the Lord and not to men? Because there's the promise in verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. How about over in Colossians? Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, remember, this section that we're doing right now, this mini-section, is the reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. So the second reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. The Bible commands that intermediate authority, that is divinely appointed leaders in the home church, the uh, workplace, and the government, he commands that they must be obeyed unless... The leadership gives commands or prohibitions that contradict the Bible. So when you rebel against divinely qualified and appointed authority, you are directly disobeying the command of the Bible. If God has placed qualified people whom he has ordained in positions of authority in any of those four spheres, and he's told you to obey it, when you don't, you're disobeying a direct command of the Bible. That's number two. The third reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. Rebellion against authority is an accusation against God. It's an accusation against God that he was stupid and didn't know what he was doing or what was best when he qualified and placed the leadership and authority, and you know better. It's really, really sad if you have to accuse God of being stupider than you. It means that you're really stupid. The fourth reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. And this is perhaps the scariest and most deadly of all of them. Rebellion against authority is an attempt to establish your own personal authority which stems from pride. In fact, this is horribly dangerous, even life-threatening as Israel discovered in the wilderness, because that's the sin of the devil when he rejected God's authority and decided to pit his own will against the will of Almighty God. He wanted to be God. He wanted God's place. He was going to do his own thing. He thought God wasn't running the universe the way God ought to be running the universe. God, step aside, let me take control for a while. And he tried to do it. And there's been a long war against God who will finally end when every knee shall bow, including the knee of the devil and his demons, and every tongue, including the tongue of the devil and his demons, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The pressure that is put on the devil to say that Jesus is Lord will be a lot more than the pressure that is put on some poor little drunk in the gutter. But Satan will bend the knee and declare Jesus is Lord because it says every tongue, whether in heaven or earth or things under the earth, every tongue 
shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Satan's pride caused him to rebel against leadership. How art thou fallen from heaven? This is Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. I can't believe our time is up. Well, we got a lot of new material in today. Lord willing, that's where we'll start next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you are the one who has ordained leadership in every sphere of authority. For those under authority, for their protection, for their blessing, for their benefit for their training, for their good, for their discipleship, for their growth. And you've made us all different, and yet you fit us together in units that are so designed that we will grow in each of those units if we respond properly, biblically, to the authority that you have placed in that sphere. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it's gone forth today. We pray that it would not return to you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.